of the Bob Graham Center. And on behalf of the center and its staff, I want to welcome you to the first and inaugural presentation of what will be a continuing series of presentations, which are called the Sam Proctor Lecture Series about Florida and about Florida's history. And uh, as I think you will soon discover, it's entirely appropriate that we had a person of the stature of Michael Grannon to, to initiate this program, since uh, Michael is not only a part of Florida history, an important one, but probably one of the preeminent historians about Florida. I'd like to introduce to you first Paul Ortiz, who is the new director of the Sam Proctor Oral History Project, who in turn will introduce Mike to you. Thank you. Good evening. It is a great privilege and an honor for me personally and professionally to be able to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Michael Gannon. Michael is Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Florida. And the title of Dr. Gannon's talk this evening is Ponce de Leon and the Discovery of Florida. Professor Gannon is one of the most distinguished and frequently cited historians in the United States. Professor Gary Mormino of the University of South Florida rightly observes, quote, Michael Gannon, a towering figure in Florida history, richly deserves his reputation as the Dean of Florida Studies. As many of you know, Samuel Proctor and Michael Gannon were dear friends and colleagues for many, many years. Therefore, this evening is especially meaningful, meaningful for us at the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. And in fact, our office manager, Roberta Peacock, just happened to be talking with Sam, Sam's wife, Bessie Proctor, uh, just this afternoon about Michael. Uh, believe it or not, what a coincidence, right? And would you like to hear what Bessie had to say about Michael? <laughs> well, you're going to hear anyway. Okay. So Bessie Proctor had this to say about Michael, about Michael Gannon. She said, the Gannons have always been close friends of ours since Michael came to study in the university. She remembers Sam saying, quote, he is a skinny yet handsome guy who borrows notes but never returns them. <laughs> Bessie also said that Sam would be very proud that Dr. Gannon was the first speaker in this series. And also at this time, I have the honor to be able to recognize Sam and Bessie's granddaughter, who is enrolled as a freshman at UF. In fact, this is her first semester. Rebecca Proctor, where's Rebecca? Would you like to stand and be recognized? We're very happy that Rebecca is following the proud tradition of being a Florida Gator. So welcome, Rebecca, to the university. So Michael has, of course, received numerous awards and honors, too, too many to even um, annotate. Uh, and he's going to receive many more in the future, I'm sure. King Juan Carlos I of Spain decorated Dr. Gannon as Knight Commander of the Order of Isabel la Catolica, among many honors that he's received. Professor Gannon is also a tireless promoter of public history and historical accuracy. Many of us first encountered Michael uh, watching television or listening to the radio. He's a wonderful public historian. Um, he's a tireless promoter of historical accuracy, for those of you who don't know him. Responding to a history text that claimed that Jamestown, Virginia, and Plymouth Rock were America's oldest cities, Dr. Gannon responded by saying, quote, by the time Plymouth Rock was founded, St. Augustine was up for urban renewal. <laughs> he continued, I hope that the powdered Whig states of the north of us take note of this and take it to heart. The Samuel Proctor Oral History Program collection is a good place to learn more about Dr. Gannon for those of you who'd like to do research on him because now he is a research subject having created so much history and, and been involved in so much history. Uh, we have interviews with Dr. Gannon. We have uh, programs that Dr. Gannon himself initiated in our collection at the Samuel Proctor Collection uh, and Program. And I encourage you to look us up on the web. 
Uh, we have some brochures about some of our, our forthcoming public programs uh, that are occurring uh, in the future. I see one or two of our advisory committee members here, uh, Professor Jack Davis, I see Professor Steve Knoll. You get into trouble when you start naming names, right? Uh, on September 24th, we'll be hosting a talk and book signing by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Rick Atkinson, which will also have to take place here at 7 p.m. on September 24th. So before I turn the floor over to Professor Gannon, I do need to mention that he received his PhD in history from the University of Florida in 1962. He taught full-time in the history department as well as in the Department of Religion. He, worked, he has worked in a number of leadership capacities at UF, including the merging of the University College and the College of Arts and Sciences into the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences in 1978. And in addition to a distinguished academic career, and many of you know this, I feel like I'm, I'm treading over familiar ground for many, many of us tonight, uh, but there are folks that may not know this, that in addition to a distinguished academic career, Dr. Gannon, or we should say Father Gannon, also served as a priest at St. Augustine's Church on University Avenue for 12 years. He has been a wonderful voice in our community on numerous civil rights and human rights causes. We know that he put his body literally on the line uh, in the early uh, 1970s uh, for the cause of civil rights and human rights. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming this remarkable scholar, the Dean of Florida Studies, a pillar of our community, and a role model for us all, Dr. Michael Gannon. Woody Allen said, half of life is showing up. I think the other half is getting up. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I thought you got carried away a bit there, but it was all done in kindness, and I appreciate your introduction. Good evening, friends. The subject given me was Juan Ponce de Leon and the European Discovery of Florida. So here goes. Five years hence, in 2013, the state of Florida will have the opportunity, if it wishes it, to observe the 500th anniversary of the first known European discovery of this peninsula. The protagonist in that story, of course, was Juan Ponce de Leon, or as most of America calls him, Ponce de Leon. He was lately governor of Puerto Rico, and he sailed here in 1513. I call his the first known European discovery because, as I shall develop shortly, uh, there may have been unrecorded Spanish slaving expeditions, and one or more of those expeditions could have stumbled upon this peninsula well before Juan Ponce came into view. And I say European discovery because in 1513, the peninsula was already populated by human beings, whom the Spaniards wrongly called Indians. According to conventional anthropological theory, these people had descended from Eurasians who had crossed the Siberia-Alaska land bridge some 12,000 years ago and had spread southward through the Americas, including the Caribbean islands, as far as Tierra del Fuego on the southern tip of South America. At the time of first contact with Europeans, the indigenous people in Florida numbered about 350,000. Not only were their ancestors the first discoverers of Florida, they were also this state's first land developers, home builders, agribusinessmen, and manufacturers however primitively those arts and crafts were practiced. Our European discoverer, Juan Ponce, was born to a noble family in the Spanish province of Valladolid in 1474. Rodrigo Ponce de Leon, one of the heroes of the Reconquista, was a model for him as he grew to manhood. Young Juan Ponce was described as red-haired, strong-muscled, and aggressive in behavior. In 1493, at the age of 19, he signed on as a gentleman volunteer on board Christopher Columbus's second voyage to the New World, landing with the great admiral 
at the island of Hispaniola, which today forms the home of two nation states, the Dominican Republic and Haiti. There, the young adventurer was schooled in the grim arts of subjugation by the island's governor, Nicolas Ovando. And in 1506, he received Ovando's permission to conquer the neighboring island of Puerto Rico, which he did, at least its western half. When in 1511, the indigenous Taino population rose up against his rule, Juan Ponce suppressed the rebellion with ruthless brutality. The Spanish king, Fernando II, confirmed him as governor of the island in 1509. But three years later, he was deposed on a technicality by Columbus's older son, Diego Colon. Now wealthy, married with children, but with time on his hands, Juan Ponce sought a new direction for his energies. He was much taken by the fact that Spanish ships were then engaged in ever-widening circular voyages in search of new islands and native populations in the Caribbean Sea and along the chain of the Lucayan, or as we say today, Bahama Islands. Some of those voyages were slaving expeditions in search of island natives to replace the native laborers of Hispaniola and later of the island of Cuba. In both places, owing to the Spaniards' introduction of harsh work practices and of European communicable diseases to which the natives had no immunities, indigenous populations were rapidly collapsing. Probably one or more of those expeditions impinged upon the Florida Peninsula, which may account for the hostility that the natives demonstrated toward Juan Ponce upon his arrival here. And it may account as well for his finding on the lower Gulf Coast of what is stated in his log as an Indian who understood the Spaniards. <clears throat> there are tantalizing suggestions of these possible first contacts. They appear in maps and charts as early as 1502, the date of a Portuguese world map known by the name of its owner, Italian nobleman Alberto Cantino. Where it depicted the Spanish Caribbean discoveries, there appears a narrow land mass that is possibly the Florida Peninsula, but is more likely the coast of Central America. More striking, a map of the islands and shores of the New World was published in 1511 by Peter Martyr, Italian, his real name was Pietro Martire d'Anghiera. He was an Italian priest humanist in the Spanish court of King Fernando II of Aragon. Drawn from oral and written reports of navigators, this map shows a long shoreline to the north of Cuba where we find labeled Isla de Bemini Parte, Island of Bimini. Now, this is not the island in the Bahama chain we know today as Bimini. This is another original Bimini. With the Grand Bahama Bank directly abutting them, the land features of Bimini and what appear to be keys descending from them could be our Florida. Deciding to participate in these seagoing exploits, Juan Ponce set his imaginative sights on this mysterious island of Bimini. And for this purpose, the Spanish crown issued him an asiento, a charter, on February 23rd, 1512. By its terms, Juan Ponce was to undertake all the costs of the expedition himself, although the monarch pledged to share with him any treasures that Juan Ponce and his ships might encounter. On March 3rd, 1513, Juan Ponce left Añasco Bay on the western side of Puerto Rico with two caravels and a Bergantina. 
Notable among the crews and passenger list on those three ships were 38-year-old Anton de Alaminos, the most experienced pilot in the islands, two women, Beatriz and Juana Jimenez, who probably were related, two African freemen, Juan Garrido and Juan Gonzalez Ponce de Leon, and two unnamed native Taino seafarer guides from Puerto Rico. <clears throat> Alaminos set a course of northwest a quarter by north that took the three ships seaward through the Mona Passage up the eastern edge of the Lucayans as far as the northernmost charted island of San Salvador. This was the Lucayan island known to its own people as Guanahani, and it was Columbus's first landfall in 1492. Columbus renamed it San Salvador, and it bears that name today. The three ships reached that uh, destination after three days of sailing, uh, pardon me, 11 days of sailing. They were at sea again on the same base compass heading, but in un unknown waters on Sunday, the 27th of March, when the crews and passengers observed the feast of Easter. That day, too, they sighted an island which probably was Eleuthera. It is well to pause here to make a few nautical observations. First, Alamino's diario, or log, no longer exists in the original. It does survive, however, in a redacted form as published in the first decade of the 17th century by Spanish historian Antonio de Herrera y Tordesillas. With corrections, the compass headings and speeds given in the log can be followed today. The great maritime historian Samuel Eliot Morrison once stated that we shall only have confidence about Juan Ponce's route when a qualified nautical historian resails the course in a comparable vessel at the same time of year. This was done in 1990 by Lieutenant Colonel Douglas T. Peck of Bradenton, Florida. A lifetime ocean yachtsman and student of 16th and 17th century deep water voyages of discovery, Peck's research vessel was a heavy displacement, full keel, double-ended, single-masted cutter with outboard rudder. Its deep underwater hull reacted to ocean currents in the same way as 16th century Spanish caravels. Working with James E. Kelly, Jr., a respected historian of early seafaring and navigation, Peck corrected Alaminos's compass headings for magnetic variation. Spanish navigators of the period used a compass made in Seville that had a 5.6 degree error. That, too, had to be allowed for. Returning to our narrative, the waters north of Eleuthera were, as I say, uncharted. Uncharted. The assumption of early writers on the voyage, T. Frederick Davis in 1935 and Edward W. Lawson in 1956, was that Alaminos continued after Eleuthera on a northwest heading past the islands of Great and Little Abaco and Gran Bahama. After passing these, the Davis-Lawson thesis held, the Juan Ponce vessels turned to a westerly heading and encountered the coast of Florida. At about the latitudes of Daytona Beach and St. Augustine. Peck, however, found that the currents pushed him west-northwest through the New Providence Channel well below the Abacos and Bahama. This was Peck's single most important finding because it would place Juan Ponce's landfall in Florida 80 miles south of Daytona Beach. This course that he was embarked on now 
west by northwest, placed the Juan Ponce vessels out of the sight of land for the next six days. When they crossed the three-knot Gulf Stream, the Spanish hulls were carried north faster than they shouldered west, with the result that on the 2nd of April, they made landfall on what turned out to be the Florida shoreline. Peck's study contends that they were at a point just south of Cape Canaveral at about 28 degrees, three minutes north latitude at or near Melbourne Beach, where they anchored in eight brazas, that is 44 feet of water. Herrera describes what followed, quote, and thinking that this land was an island, they called it La Florida, the flowery land, because it was very pretty to behold with many and refreshing trees. And it was flat, and also because they discovered it in the time of Pascua Florida, flowery Easter, as Easter was called in Spain at the time. And we go on to read in Herrera's account, for these two reasons, Juan Ponce wanted to agree in the name of La Florida. He went ashore to take formal possession of the island, as he thought it was, but there is no indication in the record <clears throat> that he encountered people indigenous to the site. After remaining in the region for six days, he raised anchor on April 8th and sailed south along a featureless coastline. On April 21st, he made his second great discovery. Though it is doubtful that he and Alaminos realized its dimensions at the time. It was the Florida Current, or as we popularly say, the Gulf Stream. That current had made itself felt when the three ships crossed it going west in the first days of April. But now, at a cape north of Lake Worth Inlet, which Juan Ponce named Cabo de las Corrientes, Cape of the Currents, it faced him head on. And with such force, that his ships were propelled backward, even though they had wind abaft the beam. One, the Bergantina, was swept out to deep water. Anchoring north of the Cape, Juan Ponce and some of his men rowed ashore in a longboat to make contact with natives whom they sighted on shore. Historians have often speculated on what passed through aboriginal minds when Florida's natives first beheld the most advanced example of European technology, the sailing ship, with its broad black hull, many times larger than a fire dug canoe, with its gunnels bristling with cannon, with its sea wind filled canvas sails breasting the waves, and its crews of white-complexioned, bearded men in steel corslets. What indeed must they have thought, and what must they have feared? The encounter that Juan Ponce and his men had with the natives did not go well. The native party assaulted the Spaniards with clubs and arrows, rendering one seaman unconscious and wounding two others. Herrera states that Juan Ponce had not wished to do the natives harm, but was forced to fight in order to save both his men's lives and their boat, oars, and weapons, which their assailants sought to seize. No cause for the natives' violence is given in the record, whether it was provoked by earlier visits of slaving expeditions or by the natives' own long tradition of intertribal warfare or by simple fear of these strange aliens from another world. Regaining his ships, Juan Ponce put in at Jupiter Inlet to take on firewood and water, only to be attacked again by a larger party of six, 60. 
This time he seized a warrior for use as a guide. He would remain anchored in the river until rejoined by the Bergantina. And somewhere along this river, which he named La Cruz, the cross, he planted a quarry stone cross inscribed with what words we do not know in the manner of other Spanish or Portuguese explorers of the period who erected a stone patron or standard to identify their claims. Finally, navigating the Cape of the Currents by hugging the shore, Alaminos navigated southward to Key Biscayne, which Juan Ponce named Santa Marta, St. Martha. And on Friday, the 13th of May, he made voyage to one of the keys, possibly Key Largo, which he named Pola, P-O-L-A, and no meaning has uh, been derived uh, for that meaning, uh, for, for that word to this date. Rounding the keys as a body, Juan Ponzo named them the martyrs, Los Martires, because, he said, viewed from afar, the rocks as they rose up seem like men who are suffering in a Roman arena. From Key West, he sailed west a short distance and then proceeded north to explore the reverse side of his island. Making a Gulf Coast landfall, it is thought, at San Carlos Bay, off the deep mouth of the Caloosahatchee River, and anchoring near the southeast tip of Sanibel Island. There, he found firewood and fresh water, careened one of his ships, and, ha and had two belligerent encounters with natives of the Calusa Nation, whose chief, Carlos, as the Spaniards pronounced and wrote his name, resided on Estero Island. The Calusa attacked the anchored ships in canoes. One Spaniard and at least four natives died in these actions leading Juan Ponce to give Sanibel its first European name, Matanzas, or slaughter. After nine days in the vicinity, a decision was made to return to Puerto Rico. Accordingly, Alaminos laid a course that took the ships south-southwest, which caused them on June 21st to come upon the waterless keys that Juan Ponce named Las Tortugas, the turtles, where the crews provisioned the vessels with, among other land and sea species, 160 loggerhead turtles. Following a brief reconnaissance of the Cuban coastline west of Havana, the expedition made for Puerto Rico. Two of the three ships reached it in mid-October. The third ship, with Chief Pilot Alaminos aboard, Juan Ponce had dispatched into the Lucayans to search for the elusive Bimini. That mystical or mythical island we must acknowledge because the idea is so indelibly linked to Juan Ponce's name was rumored at the time to contain a fountain of youth. Yes, you were wondering when I would get around to it. A fountain of youth. Let me say first that stories of such a magical water source somewhere were common not only to the Caribbean, but for centuries to the countries of Europe and Asia. In one version, the search for such waters represented an attempt to escape the inevitable consequences of old age and to postpone death. In another version, the mythical waters cured what the Spaniards call el inflacetimiento del sexo, sexual impotence. This could hardly have been a problem for Juan Ponce himself, who was only 39 years old and had recently fathered two children. But then he may simply have wanted to bottle the water and sell it on late night TV. I don't know. Anyway, in Herrera's edition of the Alaminos log, produced a century after the event, 
We find Alaminos quoted as saying about the third ship that was deployed to the Lucayans, that it was detailed, quote, to search for that celebrated fountain, which the Indians said turned men from old men into youths. I believe, however, that this was a gloss, that is, something that was added to the text by Herrera, perhaps under the influence of Peter Martyr, who had mentioned the fountain in an account of Juan Ponce's voyage written in 1535. The most convincing evidence I can produce that the citation of such a fountain in Herrera's text is a gloss is the Royal Asiento, or charter, authorizing Juan Ponce to make his voyage. After Juan Ponce lost his governorship, he traveled to Spain to lay before King Fernando II all the reasons why he wanted to mount his expedition. In issuing his charter, Fernando named in meticulous detail all of the expectations, purposes, and goals of the expedition. Read closely, one finds that a fountain of youth under that or similar expression is not mentioned. I rest my case. In 1514, Juan Ponce sailed to Spain, where he secured a revised royal asiento naming him Adelantado, a title meaning that he was a self-financing conqueror and direct representative of the king. And he also asked for and received the title of governor of the islands of Bimini and Florida. He was delayed for seven years in executing that contract by the death of his wife and his need to raise their two young daughters. During that interim, however, La Florida did not lack for Spanish visitors, including slavers, such as Pedro de Salazar during a voyage of 1514 to 16. In 1517, Alaminos, now chief pilot for Francisco Hernandez de Cordoba, took refuge in San Carlos Bay when Cordoba's expedition returned eastward from its voyage to Yucatan. And two years later, in 1519, Alonso Alvarez de Pineda put into the same bay for its firewood and drinking water during an expedition that established that Florida was not an island after all, but a peninsula attached to a huge continent. Pineda fixed its western juncture to the mainland at a feature he named after the Holy Spirit, Rio de Espiritu Santo. This could have been either the Mobile River and Bay, the Mississippi River, or Vermilion Bay, Louisiana. His own interest in Florida, no doubt requickened by news of Hernan Cortez's astonishing discoveries in Mexico, Juan Ponce wrote to the Emperor Carlos I, King of Spain, on February 10, 1521, expressing his intention to establish a permanent town, a fort, and missions to the natives in the Florida he still thought was an island. On the 26th of that month, he sailed out of Puerto Rico in two ships loaded down with 200 male and female settlers, parish priests and missionary friars, horses and domestic animals, seeds, cuttings, and agricultural implements. The site of his landing in Florida is not known with any certainty, though it has been widely assumed it was at the same San Carlos Bay region where he had visited before. In any event, the natives of that site were no more receptive to Europeans than were those Juan Ponce had encountered seven years earlier. They attacked the Spaniards as they debarked, as they erected their buildings, as they planted their crops, as they tended their cattle. And when Juan Ponce himself received a painful separating arrow wound in one of his thighs, he ordered the frustrated and fearful colonists to withdraw to Cuba. There, in July 1521, he died from his infection.
And that, my friends, is the story of Juan Ponce de Leon, and I thank you for your kind attention. If you have any questions, I'll try desperately to answer them. Chuck, you have a question, I'm sure. <laughs> or a comment. Well, as you can tell from the uh, paper that um, Mike read, uh, he is a marvelous researcher, and from the presentation that he gave, a wonderful lecture. So I think the reader must express our gratitude again that uh, he agreed to give the talk here today. Well, thank you. Thank you. I see that, yes, in the back, yes. Mike, why was he removed as governor of Puerto Rico? Because of a technicality, uh, the, uh, the elder son of Christopher Columbus uh, produced a document uh, to the king in which his father said, uh, upon my death, the, the island uh, of Puerto Rico is yours, and you will be its governor. And with that, uh, Juan Ponce had to step down. Yes? Mike, um, uh, was it unusual for someone of his uh, station to take seven years off to raise his daughter? Uh, no, um, I, I don't believe that it was. I think a man of his station and his wealth could have uh, sent the children to a school and uh, placed them under a governess. And uh, it's something of a mystery that, uh, that he uh, took himself out of uh, active life for so long a period of time. Uh, but we don't have much information, and so it's hard to make a, an estimate on what his real reasoning was. Yes? I just finished reading your book, and um, it seems to me that there was a um, bit of a different approach in Florida, that it was more focused on missionizing than was the approach in America. Well, there was a very different approach following the so-called new laws of 1542. Prior to that time, men who came to Florida abused the Indians uh, as badly as Juan Ponce had done in Puerto Rico. All you have to do is look at um, Hernando de Soto, who landed at Tampa Bay in 1539, marched north through the peninsula as far as Tallahassee, where he overwintered in 39-40, then marched on through uh, many of our southern states for four long years, dying on the banks of the Mississippi for his sins. Here is a man who uh, punished uh, the native populations of Florida as no one else during the period of exploration. He killed Indians wantonly as he made his way up through the peninsula. He would come to a native chieftain and catch the first native he could find, cut off his nose and his hands, and send him back to say, this will happen to everybody in the village unless you give us all your food and grant us safe passage. Uh, he killed people uh, randomly and uh, for no known reason. He uh, humiliated and mutilated uh, Indians. And uh, this was all before the so-called new laws of uh, 1542. And the man who did more than anyone else to bring those laws to fruition was Bartolome de las Casas, a Dominican priest who had exercised uh, ministry in Mexico and in the Caribbean islands, and was profoundly shocked, morally shocked, by the behavior of the, the Spaniards toward the native peoples of the Americas. And he went back to Spain and, and argued uh, uh, the, 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 a case of justice for these people before the king. Well, the king was taken aback by all of this and eventually called a council to consider the matter and he himself stopped his explorations. Here was a monarch at the height of his powers who called a halt to his uh, uh, spread of empire until he could determine if what he was doing was just. How often do we hear of anything like that happening in the modern world? And um, this uh, uh, monarch uh, uh, staged a debate between two great uh, 
uh, debaters Las Casas on one side, Sepulveda on the other. The issue was decided in Las Casas's favor, and new laws went out to the Indies, as the Americas were called at the time, specifying that henceforth the native people are to be understood as possessing human souls and all of the rights and dignities accorded Spaniards themselves. And with that, then, we have a, 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 a tremendous transformation in the kinds of men uh, and women, too, who come to Florida from Spain. These are men now who uh, want to spread the gospel rather than death and pestilence. And by the way, speaking of pestilence, one of the great tragedies of these early explorations is that uh, these men, uh, uh, Panfilo de Nevaeth, Hernando de Soto, uh, trailed behind them pathogens, yellow fever and, uh, and uh, smallpox and uh, diphtheria and tuberculosis and so on, to which the native peoples had no acquired immunities and they died, their, their societies collapsed in the wake of these entradas, these expeditions. So there was an un, un, a phenomenon that was not understood at all because there was no germ theory at the time. So uh, not only do we have violence uh, with the sword, but violence with the pathogens. It was, it was a kind of microbial invasion that accompanied the physical invasion. Well, the people who come afterwards, uh, uh, Canter de Babastro, Tristan de Luna, Pedro Menendez de Aviles, these were all men who had the interests of the native people at heart and proved it by their deeds. And you have the end of that awful period. So uh, that's how it all happened. And uh, it's part of a very large story that embraces the, the whole of the Indies in Mexico, Peru, and other possessions of Spain. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for your kind attention. I tried to rescue you some water. <laughs>